this is going to be a great evening because we're going to learn more about our Catholic faith. And any, and any opportunity that we have to learn about our Catholic faith is a good evening. So as people are coming in, I'll just mention a few things before we start, because people are still walking in. I brought some books that I've written, uh, so I'll just mention a few of them. Right now, a lot of people are, have a lot of anxiety and, uh, you know, their stress and depression. I actually wrote a Catholic joke book. People are saying, hey, you got anything for kids? I do. It's called Our Mouths Were Filled With Laughter. So I got a Catholic joke book that I've, that I've written. Here's something interesting. You probably aren't used to seeing this uh, picture of the smiling Jesus. G.K. Chesterton says that, that in the Bible, Jesus Christ is never depicted as laughing. Or, or, or There's not one verse that says that he laughed. And many of the saints say that the reason Jesus Christ didn't laugh, or at least it wasn't recorded in the Bible, had Jesus laughed, G.K. Chesterton and many others say, the whole universe could not have contained his laughter because he's God. I also wrote, this is a book that became a Catholic bestseller uh, last year. It's called The Devil in the City of Angels, where I go deep, if you want to learn about Santa Muerte, Santeria, Demonic Possession, Oppression, Obsession, House Infestation. I go deep into that. Uh, and, and spiritual warfare. Also, there's another book uh, that I wrote. It's called What's Wrong with Marijuana? And in here, I, I, give si I argue six different ways. I use theology, scripture, philosophy. I use law. I use common sense. I use federal government statistics. I use reason. Uh, and so I argue from about six different vantage points. I also share, show a lot the way the whole marijuana industry is connected a lot to the Mexican cartels who are uh, sat satanic worshipers. <clears throat> the biggest problem that young people face when they go to school is the problem of Marxist atheism. They'll go home after a couple of years. Even after going to Catholic school, they say, Mom, Dad, I don't believe in God anymore. I wrote a book, it's called Atheism is the Opiate of the Elites. 50 questions and answers. I take the 50 most common questions that these liberal propagandist Marxist professors, uh, you know, insert into a young person's mind, and I answer them with science and philosophy. Uh, a lot of the book is based on a lot of based scientific arguments that Catholics have never heard. Catholics invented science, so I, I argue a lot, not only from theology and philosophy, but from science as well. And the most popular book that I've written for men is called Lord Prepare My Hands for Battle. It's this book right here. We use this in the men's prayer group. And I think Wayne and others could tell you it's got some good stuff in here, right Wayne? <laughs> okay. All right, let's begin. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let's pray the Our Father, the perfect prayer that Jesus taught us. And so let's pray all together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. And let's pray to St. Michael the Archangel prayer. He's a warrior angel given to us by God, created by God, and he's known in the Catholic Church as the commander of the army of the angels. And there's a prayer that was written by Pope Leo XIII that's a minor exorcism prayer. Same with the Our Father. The Our Father is also a minor exorcism prayer. You notice what we said at the end. Deliver us from evil. Who's evil? It's Satan. And so let's pray this next minor exorcism prayer. St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our defense against the wickedness and snares of the devil. And God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all evil spirits, and prowl about the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. Virgin Most Powerful, pray for us. Our Lady Guadalupe, St. Joseph, Terror of Demons, pray. all you holy angels and saints of God, pray. in the name of the Father, Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Okay, I talk kind of fast, and so because I do talk fast, I prepared an outline, so you don't have to say, what did he say? And you're writing notes on your hand, on your palm, forget about that, you got the notes. Okay? You could doodle some stuff on, on the page there, and go home and teach this to your friends and your family. I want to talk about what the Bible says. By the way, the, 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 the Bible was put together by the Catholic Church, in case you're wondering. The Old Testament was written by the Jews. It's called the Hebrew Scriptures. The Catholic Church 
received the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures, from the Jews because the first Catholics were all Jews. And the New Testament was written in Greek by the apostles. It was the Catholic Church that took both of these testaments, which means agreement or covenant, put them together in 382 AD at a council in Rome. So it was the Catholic Church that put the table of contents. When somebody tells me, uh, when they talk about you know uh, the Bible, I say, you know the table of contents in your Bible? Yeah. I said, who put that those table of contents together? I don't know. Well, you went to seminary, you should know. Why don't you ask your pastor? I don't know, but the Catholic Church did in 382 AD. So it was the church that decided what books were infallible scripture, but then the Protestants took out seven books at the Protestant Reformation after 1521. So Protestant Bibles have seven missing books from the Old Testament. They have an incomplete Bible. But that's not tonight's talk. Tonight's talk is the three enemies of the soul. I want to talk about the interior life. This is what's more important, the interior life. How do you get to heaven? We have to have a strong interior life. And so let's go through some basics here before we do a deep dive. Let's talk about what temptation is. I talked about it last time, but this is relevant for today's topic as well. This is from the Catechism of the Catholic Church, page 901. It's in the back of the Catechism. It's called the Glossary. Here's the definition of a temptation. An attraction either from outside oneself, that outside oneself would be a demon, or it would be some, some social structure of sin, like, for example, cruising by a gentleman's club and you see... Uh, Pictures of immodest women and you're tempted to go in. That would be an attraction from the outside or a demon as well. Catechism also says, or a temptation is also from within. Why are we tempted from within? Because we're sinners. Sinners are tempted, to, to, sinners are tempted by sin. They're attracted to sin. All of us are. We're all sinners. From the Pope all the way down. Every single Pope, every single person on planet Earth. And that's what the goal of the Christian, Catholic Christian life is is to become holy and get to heaven. The word holy, don't be afraid of the word holy. Doesn't mean you're floating around and stuff like with a, with, with a halo. The word holy in Hebrew, Kaddish, means to live a life set apart. In other words, if people are doing this, that's fundamentally wrong, like worshiping the golden calf and having orgies in the book of Exodus, you're saying, not me, I'm gonna be chased and I'm gonna worship the one true God. That's what the word holy means. When everybody after work says, let's go get drunk, uh, and, and uh, I know a bar where there's a bunch of prostitutes, you say, no, I'm gonna go home. I'm going home because I, I wanna be faithful to my wife and remain faithful. To be set apart, that's what the word holy means. That's it. So every one of us is called to be holy. In Greek, the word is hagio. Again, it means to be set apart and don't allow yourself to be corrupted by this, by this, by this world, by the corruption of the world. The Catechism says, so temptation uh, is to act contrary to right reason and the commandments of God. Jesus himself during his life on earth was tempted, put to the test, to manifest both opposition between himself and the devil and the triumph of his saving work over Satan. So Jesus allowed himself to be tempted as an example to us, to show us exactly how we fight temptation. And he did it as an example for us. As Catholics, one of the prayers that we pray after you go to confession with a priest is the act of contrition. This is a prayer you should be doing on your own every single night before you go to bed because we all sin throughout the day, maybe not mortal sin, but at least venial sins, okay? Just living in America and watching, you know, watching some political channel on television is going to cause you, when you see certain people, you're going to get triggered and you're going to start, you know, slander, detraction, calumny. Those are all venial sins. So at night, before you go to bed, it's a good practice as part of your night prayers to pray the act of contrition. The church teaches if you pray the act of contrition, all your venial sins are wiped away. If you, there's, you know, there's the old form of the act of contrition and the new form. I got both of them in my book. You've, you've heard it before. Uh, uh, it's, uh, I, um, oh my God, I'm hardly sorry for having offended thee, and I detest all my sins because of thy just punishment, but most of all because they offend thee, my God, who are all good and deserving of all my love. I firmly resolve with the help, it's right there. I firmly resolve, it's right there in my notes, that last sentence, with the help of thy grace, grace means power, strength, to sin no more, 
and to avoid the near occasion of sin. Amen. That's a beautiful prayer to pray before you go to sleep. All your venial sins are wiped away. And if you have no mortal sin, boy, you're in a state of grace. So, temptation is also, look at the, look at the first and second bullet. Temptation is also an occasion of sin. Is any person, object, or situation that might cause us to fall. There are four different types of temptation. Number one, you have the near occasion, the near occasion through which we always tend to fall. You know certain things that if you say, mm, I go, if I go on this website, mm, I'm going to fall. You know it. You already know yourself as Aristotle says. Okay, Everyone knows yourself and you know where you're weak at. The second type of temptation is called remote occasion through which we may sometimes fall. Sometimes. Okay? The third type of temptation is called voluntary occasions, meaning the ones that we're able to avoid. There's a lot of things you're able to avoid. There's a lot of people, you know, people that I grew up with, I, I stay away from them, even family members. <laughs> Why? Because just the way they talk, their whole behavior, their mannerisms, their whole, again, their, their appetites, their disordered appetites, I don't want to be around them and participate with them. So there's some, there are some people even within my family, I have I don't dislike them, I pray for the conversion, I just have nothing to do with them because they're a near occasion of sin for me. Number four, then you've got the involuntary occasions. Those are, those are temptations which we are unable to avoid. For example, you know, right now, just for example, you work for a company that's uh, acting like a Gestapo and saying, you've got to, you know, you've got to uh, uh, take the double vaccine and you want to keep your job and stuff. And you're saying, wait a minute, I don't want to stick my arm with aborted fetal cells in my body. I don't know what else is in those, those mRNA injections. Again, those are, that's an involuntary occasion where you're tempted probably to participate in something that's, that's intrinsically evil. Okay, so... Our five senses are the doors to our mind and heart. Whatever we see, hear, feel, can create thoughts which stir up desire and lead us astray into sin. So what do we have to do as Catholics? Because the demons are always projecting thoughts, images, voices, locutions, apparitions, phantasms into your mind. The battlefield is the mind. This is why the greatest Catholic priest, arguably, St. John Vianney, he's the patron saint of parish priests, so I think I'm on good ground saying what I just said. The patron saint of all parish priests for 2,000 years, known for his incredible holiness, St. John Vianney says that the devil enters into the human person, or demons enter into a human person through one of your five senses. Through one of the five senses. This is why we're called to take custody take custody of our five senses. If we do, it helps us live, live a life of virtue. And what it means by taking care of taking custody of your senses, you know, there's just some things that you shouldn't watch. Somebody goes, hey dude, hey, check this out. Did you see Beyonce's last video? Say, I don't wanna see it. You already know what you're gonna see. Hey, hey dude, have you seen Lady Gaga's last video? Uh, no, thank you, I don't wanna see it. Guard your senses. Hey, dude, have you seen the latest song from such and such? I don't even want to repeat their name in church anymore. The roof's going to fall in. No, I don't want to hear the, the, the latest song from the latest rapper. You know, I, I don't want to hear it. A, a near occasion of sin can also be your computer. Don't let your computer control you. You've got to control that computer. Demons can come through the house. Who said the same Father de Pio? Demons can come into your house through the images on a screen. Television screen or computer screen or your iPhone screen. Demons can come in. Evil images portrayed in a screen are doors or portals for demons to come into the house. Let's take a look at what the Catechism says about the Holy Spirit and temptation. It says... Paragraph 2847, the Holy Spirit makes us discern, that means understand. Discern means understand right and wrong. Makes us discern between trials which are necessary for the growth of the inner man and temptation 
which leads to sin and death. We must also discern between being tempted and consenting to temptation. I mentioned that last month. This is important. No temptation is a sin. What is a sin is the consent to that temptation. Consenting. But again, temptation, the, it, it's a good thing to remove yourself from the temptation. Because if you don't remove yourself from the temptation, you're going to fall into consent. There was a friend of mine, he, he's a good Catholic guy, said, dude, you're a liar. I should slap you for what you just said, but I'm a Catholic, so I won't do that. He goes, Jess, my prayer life is so strong. My interior life is so strong. I can go to a nudist beach and I won't lust for anybody. I said, you're a blank liar. That was a foolish statement you made. You know why? Because you're not an angel. You have a body. And your body is triggered by what it sees. Until you're perfected in heaven as a saint, you're not going to have those disordered passions. But you'd be a fool as a Catholic man to go to a beach where everybody's naked and friends. That would be absolutely foolish. I, I want to test myself. You're a fool. That's Satan speaking to you. Okay, turn off that. Turn that off. Yeah. Uh, let's continue. The catechism says... We must also discern between being tempted and consenting to temptation. Okay, so it's consenting to the temptation. That's a sin, not the temptation itself. Finally, discernment unmasks the lie of temptation, whose object appears to be a good, a delight to the eyes, and desirable, which in reality, its fruit is death. Origen, one of the church fathers, says, God does not want to impose the good, but wants free beings. There's a certain usefulness to temptation. No one but God knows what our soul has received from Him, not even we ourselves. But temptations, temptation reveals it in order to teach us to know ourselves. In this way, we discover our evil inclination and are obliged to give thanks for the goods that temptation has revealed to us. So that's, he's a second century church father and historian. He's saying that, the reason God allows us to feel temptations is so we can know those areas of weakness and start strengthening those areas of weakness. Short up those areas, take custody of those areas, say, ah, I'm weak in this area. Every time I, time I see an In-N-Out burger on television, I jump in my car and go get a double-double, okay? God allows you to see your weaknesses through these temptations so that you can fight and resist and shore up those areas and become stronger. The Catechism says in 2848, the phrase, lead us not into temptation, implies a decision of the heart. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. No one can serve two masters. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. In this ascent, to the Holy Spirit, the Father gives us strength. Now this is right from the Bible. This is in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, this verse. No testing has overtaken you that is not common to men. God is faithful and God will not let you be tempted beyond your strength, but with the temptation it will also provide the way of escape so that you may be able to endure it. That's a promise from God in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Number one, God is faithful. Number two, all of us as, as, as human beings, we're all tempted. But the Bible promises that God will not let you be tempted beyond your strength. In other words, God is going to give you the ammunition, the tools, the gasoline, the grace, the power, the strength to be able to endure and resist and fight against that temptation. God is not going to give you more than you can handle. That's what the Bible says. And we believe it. Amen? Amen. St. Thomas More, patron saint of lawyers. Pray for them, St. Thomas More. Yeah. St. Thomas More said this, Occupy your minds with good thoughts, or the enemy, the devil, will fill them with bad ones. Unoccupied, your mind cannot be. There's too many people that have too much time in their hands. And as a result of that, they get in a lot of trouble. That's why it's good for a Catholic to always be pushing yourself and always be working through a, a good spiritual book. Every Catholic 
should be taking down one good spiritual book a month. That's 12 good solid books a year. Apart from the Bible and your prayer life. Just, just continually developing and, and, and strengthening the inner man. Your interior life, your spiritual life. By reading good Catholic books. Because what ends up happening. So many. Here's, here's an up. I fly a lot because I give lectures around the country. I just came back from Wisconsin. I'm going this weekend to Michigan. So I spent a lot of time in airports. Um, I remember a couple of weeks ago, there was a guy in front of me. He was probably about 20 years younger. He was probably in his, I don't know, late 30s, early 40s. And he was, he had a, a pornographic magazine. And he's, he's right lying in front of me. And he's holding it up. And he's got these pictures. And he's, and right behind him, I was reading a book from Pope John Paul II, Theology of the Body. Okay, I'm right behind him. Theology of the Body is how to, how to fight against pornography and resist the over-sexualized culture of death of ours. And so, I, for a second I said, God is looking at two of his children on earth. One guy's cutting his teeth on penthouse. One guy's reading Pope John Paul II, Theology of the Body. And God saw both of us. He's standing right in front of me. There are so many people, as I travel around the country, that fill their minds with bad information. I forget what saint, it was a female, uh, it, was a, it was a nun back in the Middle Ages. It'll come to me right now. But she said, God gave her a vision of hell. And she said that there's many people in hell because they read bad books. Many people in hell because they spend their life reading bad books. Paragraph 2849, let's take a look at the catechism, what it says. It says, such a battle and such a victory becomes possible only through prayer. It is by his prayer that Jesus vanquishes the tempter, that's the devil, both at the outset of his public mission and in the ultimate struggle of his agony. In this petition to our Heavenly Father, Christ unites us to His battle and to His agony. He urges us to vigilance of the heart in communion with His own. Vigilance is custody of the heart. And Jesus prayed for us to the Father, keep them in your name. The Holy Spirit constantly seeks to awaken, awaken us to keep watch. Finally, this petition... This petition takes on, takes on, on, on all its dramatic meaning in relation to the last temptation of our earthly battle. It asks for final perseverance. Lo, I'm coming like a thief. Blessed is he who is awake. So what is prayer? If we fight the devil through prayer, what is prayer? There's three forms of prayer. You got vocal prayer. You got meditative prayer, the mind. You got contemplative prayer. When you just go into this deep sacred silence. So there are levels of prayer. But as a Catholic, let, let me give you a piece of advice because I've been doing this for a long time and I've been studying this for a long time and I've been, I've been studying from the best exorcists in the country for many years. When you're tempted, probably you've been told that you should immediately uh, reject, rebuke, and renounce the temptation in Jesus' name. That's a good practice. Saint Theophan, the Russian saint, back in the 19th century, he says, as soon as you get a temptation projected into your mind, immediately go to Jesus and reject, rebuke, RRR. Reject, rebuke, and renounce that temptation in Jesus' name. You have to do it in His name. He's the one that has power over the demons, not you. If you just rebuke them and don't call on Jesus' name, that statement was powerless. So you get a temptation, a demonic projection, RRR. I reject, rebuke, and renounce this evil spirit of anger in Jesus' name. And then take authority over yourself. Be gone. Where do you, where do you send the demon to? Be gone to the foot of the cross that Jesus Christ may do with you as he wills. That's the way you pray as a Catholic. Temptation is projected in the mind. Okay? You assess, you say, ah, oh, I'm being tempted. This thought's not my thought. These thoughts, aren't, these thoughts aren't coming from my heart. You say, 
I reject, rebuke, and renounce this evil spirit of anger in Jesus' name. Go to the foot of the cross that Jesus Christ may do with you as he wills. And then start talking to God. Start either singing or talking spontaneously to God or getting into road prayer. The rosary, the divine mercy, something. Because what demons want to do is humans are called to have a personal relationship with God. This is Catholic teaching, papal teaching. Demons are called to have a personal relationship with God. What a demon tries to do when they tempt you, they're trying to take you away from God. They want to have a personal relationship with you. That's what demonic possession is called. A personal relationship with a demon. They just intercepted. They just got between you and God. And now it's you and them. And so this is why. I'm going to walk you through it. Boom. I just got a demonic projection. I just got tempted. I recognize it. I'm not going to consent to the temptation. Because I know they're not my thoughts. And I know it's not my guardian angel that put those thoughts there. Or those images. And so I say. I reject, rebuke, and renounce the spirit of anger in Jesus' name. Go to the foot of the cross. Why can I talk with that authority? Because you have a thought, you have a hundred percent authority in relation to yourself because you are you. I have a hundred percent of authority over me because I'm me. Could I pray like this for a stranger in the street? No, I don't have authority over him, he's his own person. He would have to do that for himself. I can pray intercessory prayer. Lord Jesus, this man is a drug addict, Lord, and he needs your help. Lord, I, I ask you, I beg you, that you give him the grace to pray, pray, uh, break that demonic addiction to heroin. Lord, just, Lord, fill him with pious thoughts and fill him with your spirit and love and open the eyes of his heart. Say, amen. See the difference? The way I pray for a stranger on the street and the way I pray for myself I don't have authority over the person on the street. So you have to do what's called a prayer of supplication. You have to ask Jesus to help that person. That's called in Catholicism a prayer of supplication or petition. But in relationship to me, when I'm attacked, I'm, I'm, going, I'm going full ballistic here. I order you, leave me. Go to the foot of the cross. I rebuke, renounce, and reject you in Jesus' name. I can pray like that because I have 100% authority over myself. Let's see who the enemies of, our, of truth are and the enemies of our soul. This is probably the most fascinating section. That's why people came tonight because of this section. You want to know who are our enemies. Our first enemy as Roman Catholic Christians, children of God, is the devil. If you want a good description of the devil, on the, on the book I wrote is called The Devil in the, in the City of Angels. On chapter one, I go into deep into the history of how this good angel, seraphic angel called Lucifer, how he fell and what he is now and what are the characteristics of Lucifer, Satan, or the devil, which is the same, which is the same fallen angel. But our Lord Jesus Christ says in the Bible in John chapter 8, 44, he identifies the devil for us. And look at what he says about him. He tells the Pharisees and Sadducees. He says, by the way, here's something very interesting. And I uh, just, you'll see where I'm going with this. In the Bible, Jesus is always rebuking the people in power. The, those that are in, in positions of earthly, and even some of the, some of the religious power for their hypocrisy. And so, the same applies today. The devil, the devil goes after specifically people of power, like politicians. Those are the, his favorite people to go after. Who said that? Father Gabriel Amorth, Rome's exorcist for 29 years that just passed away a few years ago. He said in a long interview four years ago, he says, the devil prefers to go after politicians. Why? Why? Because if he afflicts a politician and gets a politician to align his will with Satan's will, with his will, he can maximize damage in a country, a city, a town because the politicians have a lot of power 
and they can maximize damage for evil. So their preferred people to go after are people of power, people of influence, billionaires, okay? Uh, scientists, people that have the ability to say, put on a mask and stay six feet apart. He goes after power players. Is this, since the Bible, he's been doing this. When Jesus is rebuking in John 8, 44, who's he talking to? He's talking to the power players of Israel, the Pharisees and Sadducees, which were the political and religious leaders. Here's what he says. You are of your father, the devil. He said that to politicians and religious leaders. And your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, the devil, and has nothing to do with the truth because there's no truth in him. When he lies, the devil, he speaks according to his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. There's so much Luciferian, diabolical misinformation and disinformation right now that's going on in our country. The devil operates 90% of our news networks. I can prove that. Uh, and you, can, you can look this article up on, 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 uh, on the web. 90% of the news networks, and not, watch what I'm saying here. 90% of the news networks are owned by six billionaires. <clears throat> so, there's a little communication in the morning. They call each other up. It's like roll call when I was a cop. They call each other up and they say, okay, today we're going to say this. Okay? We're going to say, Jess Romero's an idiot. Next network. So you turn on from one network to another one. Jess Romero's an idiot. Jess Romero's an idiot. Jess Romero's an idiot. Jess Romero's an idiot. They all sing from the same song sheet. They're all Luciferian. They hate Jesus. They hate truth. 90% of what you watch is controlled by six billionaires that work for Satan. You have to be very careful where you get your information from. Continue. 1 Peter 5 8. St. Peter, the first pope, writes Be sober, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Look at the way the first pope describes the devil. I don't know about you, I've been to, I've been to the zoo a number of times. I'm glad there's a cage between me and the lion. And I'm sure you are too. I wouldn't want to be one second in a cage with a lion, especially when he's hungry. And yet Jesus, or St. Peter, describes the devil like a lion. In other words, the king of the jungle, ominous, ferocious, always looking to devour and destroy. This is our enemy right here. We're not talking about some lightweight. That's why it bugs me when Catholics, you know, Halloween's coming up, and if you want to hear what I think about Halloween, go on the internet. I did a lecture, it's called Jess Romero on Halloween. You can, and I source everything I say from church teachings. But it bugs me when I see Catholics dressing like demons or like things that are macabre and dark because they're glorified. Satan is laughing when he sees a Catholic put on the disguise of something evil. Satan is laughing. Next verse, 2 Corinthians 4, 4, St. Paul says about the devil, he says, in their, case, in their case, the God, look what he calls Satan, the God, lowercase g, the God of this world, the devil, has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the likeness of God. Now, we don't know how that happens, but in some way, shape, or form, because the devil is a fallen angel that has preserved his preternatural powers as an angel. And angels are so much more powerful than we are, much more intelligent, and just they just have a greater capacity for everything than we do as human beings. Angels do. Demons are fallen angels. They retain those powers. In some way, shape, or form, St. Paul tells us that they, they cause intellectual blinding of people. How? I don't know. We'll find out one day 
please God when we're in heaven. How did they do that? But that's why every night, because I know demons go after us intellectually to blind us. Every night before I go to bed, I, 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 there's a prayer that I pray. It's in my prayer book, Lord, prepare my hands for battle on page 117. Every night I ask the Blessed Virgin Mary, who has total power and authority over demons, given to her by Jesus in Genesis 3.15, I ask Our Lady every night to blind demons so they don't attack me. So they can, it's a prayer. August Queen of Heaven, Heavenly Sovereign, the angels, thou hast received the mission and power to crush the head of Satan. Uh, and and we, ask, we ask for that prayer. Blind them, Mother Mary, so that it, so they don't see what we're doing. Blind them. So what demons do to us, every night before I go to bed, me and Anita, when we get home right now, we're going to pray that prayer. It takes a couple of minutes. We're going to ask Mary, uh, uh, our, our Lady to blind the demons that are attacking me or my children, my children's spouses, my grandkids. Because your prayer, when you pray, and when you pray, make sure you're praying for your family, especially you men and husband and wives. Say, these prayers are for me and my wife and for my children as well, my progeny, my offspring. Say it, okay? These prayers are for my offspring. And the prayers, they flow downward down the family train. Matthew chapter 4, verse 1, our Lord Jesus Christ says this. Then the Holy Spirit says, I mean, St. Matthew writes, guided by the Holy Spirit. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. So what does the devil do? Tempt people. Now, the fathers of the church and the saints and doctors of the church tell us that the devil wasn't sure, wasn't sure if Jesus Christ of Nazareth was the Son of God, the Messiah. He wasn't sure. And that's why he's tempting him to see, is this the Son of God who became a man and came down to earth? Wasn't positive. He became sure that he was the Son of God. It was at Calvary when Christ died. That's why you see that moment in the movie that uh, Mel Gibson made the Passion of the Christ. When our Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross, then the cameras pan over and the devil starts screaming. Why is that? At that moment, he recognized that was the Son of God who shed blood on Calvary now released us. Released us from the bondage of sin and opened up the gates of heaven. And he realized that he had been fooled. He's the one that put in the minds of the Jews and the Romans to kill this person, Jesus of Nazareth, not realizing that when he spilled his blood, that blood now objectively redeems the human race, which means what? All of us had a ball and chain, like prisoners, prisoners on our way to hell. The ball and chain was taken up, that's objective redemption, and the gates of heaven were thrown open now. Now we can go to heaven. That's what happened on Calvary when he spilled his blood. That's why Satan screamed. At that moment, he found out this was the Son of God, and I'm a fool. His blood pays the price for everybody, starting from Adam and Eve all the way down to the last person that will ever be born. Of course, you can lose that grace. It's called mortal sin. And you, have, you can restore that grace by going back to confession and getting right with God. Revelation chapter 12, verse 10, the Bible says... John the Apostle writes, And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and power of the kingdom of our God and the authority of His Christ have come. For the accuser, look what John calls the devil, the accuser, accuser of our brethren has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. The word accuser is also another word, prosecutor. The devil is a prosecutor. When you die, the devil is going to be saying, this is why you should not let Jess Romero in. This is why you should not Je let Jess Romero in. This is why you should not let Jess Romero in. He's going to be prosecuting me. Now, what does the Bible call Jesus and the Holy Spirit? Calls them the advocate. Jesus is called our advocate. The Holy Spirit is called our advocate. What does the word advocate mean? Lawyer. So when I die... I'm going to have a lawyer before God the Father. His name is Jesus Christ. And so are you if you die in a state of grace. And guess what? Your lawyer is going to tell God the Father, not guilty. I died for sins. Prosecutor, you're fired. Get out of here. Now, if you die and you don't have that lawyer called Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, the advocate, guess what? Who's going to prosecute your case? Satan. And you're going to lose because you have no lawyer. Pope Pius X said, all the strengths, St. Pope Pius X, excuse me, St. Pope Pius X said, by the way, I'll just say something, I'll just throw it out there. It's the greatest Pope in the last hundred years. God, I beg you to give us another St. Pope Pius X. I beg you. I beg you, Lord. St. Pius X said, 
All the strength of Satan's reign is due to the easygoing weakness of Catholics. Who's our next enemy? Our next enemy is the world. But because the world is controlled by the devil. Where does it say that? Well, I'll give you the evidence right here. Four Bible verses. John 12, 31, our Lord says, Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the ruler, that's a reference to Satan. Jesus is called Satan. The ruler of this world would be cast out. That's what's going to happen to Satan. He will be cast out. When Christ comes back at the end, the devil's going to be cast out. But the, Jesus is called the devil, the ruler of this world. John 14, 30. I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming. He has no power over me. Jesus is called the devil, the ruler of this world. You don't think this world is ruled by Satan? Look at what's going on. Communism, infiltration of communism, Marxism, socialism, Nazism, fascism, anarchy, liberalism, modernism, progressivism, the destruction of the family, the destruction of marriage, the killing of babies, the marrying of men, the promotion of sodomy. This world's not run by Satan. Medical marijuana, it's medicine, it's medicine, it's good for you. This world's not run by Satan. Open your eyes. The good news is that we were not made for this world. We're going to win. Amen. We were made for heaven. Amen? Amen. And Jesus Christ already paid the price for your sins. You just have to, every day and in every way, open your heart to Jesus by a life of faith and prayer and coming to Mass every Sunday and opening your mouth like a little baby and sticking out your tongue and receiving Jesus Body, blood, soul, and divinity in holy communion with the faith of a child. Jesus has given us the plan on how to get to heaven. We just have to cooperate. Amen. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1 and 3, the Bible says, And you he made alive when you were dead through the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following, the, look what Jesus calls the devil, the prince of the power of the air. The spirit that is now at work at the sons of disobedience. Among these, we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, following the desires of our body and mind, so that we were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Look what uh, Paul the Apostle just said about the people that follow their emotions, their appetites, their fallen nature. He calls them sons of disobedience. He calls them children of wrath. 1 John 5, 19, the Bible says, We know that we are of God, and the whole world is of the power of the evil one. The evil one is Satan. Pope St. Pius V, pray for us, another holy pope. He said, All the evils of the world are due to lukewarm Catholics. All the evils of the world are due to lukewarm Catholics. Now, this gets very personal. The devil attacks our flesh. What does it mean our flesh? Our emotions are triggered. Our passions are triggered. Our disordered appetites are triggered. And that causes our body, our flesh, to start moving and inclining towards a life of sin. The Bible tells us in 1 Timothy 5.15. Paul tells Timothy, for some have already strayed after Satan. 1 Thessalonians 3.5. It, it says, for this reason, when I can no longer, when I can bear it no longer, I sent that I might know your faith for fear that somehow the tempter, that's the devil, had tempted you and that our labor would be in vain. Romans 7, 18 and 19. For I know that nothing good dwells within me that is in my flesh. I can will what is right, but I cannot do it. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do. St. Paul's talking about the struggle. All of us have a struggle. There's a beast within us. It's called, it's called our passions, our flesh. Our flesh has an, in, it's called concupiscence. We have this inclination to evil. We, how do we fight against it? We were baptized. We became children of God. We're not monsters or zombies. We're children of God. Baptism gives us the spirit of God. The life of the Catholic faith, prayers, reading, 
The sacraments, it gives us now the strength and power to fight against those disordered passions called our fallen nature. Our fallen nature. The fancy word is concupiscence. You don't believe people have a fallen nature? Go, to, go visit somebody in prison or in a county jail. You're going to look at hundreds if not thousands of people that are in there because they didn't follow their intellect. They followed their passions. They followed their bodily appetites. The intellect formed by the word of God, by life of faith and prayer, masters the body, masters the passions. Sometimes you have to tell your body, no, it's a good word. You have to tell that to kids sometimes. No, you can't have six beers, you can have one at Saturday. The intellect has to tell the body, no. Too many people allow the body, the passions and emotions to override the intellect. What they know what is right. And they're saying. Oh but it feels good. This is the whole struggle. We're going to be fighting. Who's going to win? Whoever you feed more. If you feed your body more. Your passions more. Your, your, your passions will override your intellect. If you feed your intellect. With the word of God. And prayer and faith. And the power of the sacraments. And the rosary. Your intellect will win. And master your passions. It's that simple. Our jails are full of people that didn't learn this. They didn't learn this. The war that's going on within us, the spirit and the body. St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2.14, he says, the unspiritual man, so there's two types of people on planet earth. Here it is. Unspiritual and spiritual. Look what he says. The unspiritual man does not receive the gifts of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, or, or foolishness to him. And he's not able to understand them because they're spiritually discerned. You can only understand these spiritually. The spiritual man judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Amen? Amen. We have the mind of Christ. This is why, just for example, just this is why no Catholic can ever vote for a pro-abortion politician. Why? Because we have the mind of Christ. Don't get caught up in party. Get caught up in what God says. God is pro-life. If there's any politician or party that's pro-death, you cannot vote for him. Why? Because you have the mind of Christ. Jesus is not a killer. He's a healer. Amen. He's not a murderer. He's a savior. Amen. First Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 to 3, the Bible says, But I, brethren, could not address you as spiritual men, but as men of the flesh, as babes in Christ, I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. And even yet, you are not ready, for you are still of the flesh. For, for while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving like ordinary men? What is St. Paul doing here? He's talking to the Corinthians. They're baptized. They're already followers of Christ, but they're midgets. They're, in, they're, they're spiritual midgets. They don't want to grow in their faith. So St. Paul is telling them, you, you guys are like unspiritual men of the flesh. Yeah, you're baptized. You're part of the church. You've been taught the prayers of the church. You've been taught a relationship with God. But you still have to get fed baby food because you're still, you're still like an infant Christian. You're not growing up in your inner man. You're not growing up intellectually. You're not growing in virtue. He is criticizing Catholic Christians in the city of Corinth and in Greece for being babies. How many parishes do we have around the 17,000 in the U.S.? How many spiritual babies are there in the Catholic Church that are going to Mass on Sunday? Say, do you pray the rosary? Huh? What is that? What is that? You, you read your Bible? No, I never, I don't open up the Bible. We have a bunch of Corinthians in the Catholic Church, our spiritual babies. Do you wear blessed objects? Oh no, my grandma used to wear that stuff. I don't do that. I'm sophisticated. Do you got holy water in your house? Ah, that's my, that's the superstitious stuff my grandma had. There's a bunch of 
Corinthian Catholics in the church right now that are babies, they're eating baby Gerber food. They don't want to grow up. Now, here's just a little caveat that I put at the bottom of the notes here. Uh, drugs and alcohol break down your willpower to resist temptation. I should have put that on page one. If, if, yeah, I, I, I botched it up there. Botched it up. Okay. Let me make some summary comments. I got 10 minutes. <clears throat> Opposition to God comes from, a, from at least three areas, each of which requires specific resistance. Again, we'll go through it again. From, from uh, the world. The Greek word cosmos has several meanings, but in this context, it refers to a system in rebellion against God. It is external in nature. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 to 17 indicates that temptations from the world attack us through number one, the lust of the flesh, which is designed to trigger a physiological response. Number two, the lust of the eyes, designed to, manip to manipulate our love of beauty and the boastful pride of life, designed to promote selfish ambition. The biblical response to such attacks is found in verse 17, where John the Apostle says, and the world passes away and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. Evaluate the solicitation and say, yes to the things that have eternal value and no to options that have only temporary value and pleasure. Spending eternal treasure for temporary trash is a bad trade. The flesh. Warfare of the flesh can also trigger physiological responses within our body and mind. The source of this attack is internal. An active traitor still within each Christian. And I got all the Bible verses to tell you about the inner struggle that we have within our flesh. You can read those at home. Uh, but the, the biblical responses to the attacks from the flesh are to flee temptation. The Bible says in 2, 2, 2 Timothy 2.22, flee temptation. Number two, renew your mind. How do you renew your mind? A life of faith and a life of praying and a life of reading. Reading the right things and a life of prayer. This is the way you renew the mind. And to walk controlled by the Holy Spirit. Galatians 5.16. There's a prayer that I pray every morning. One of my morning prayers. It's in my book, my morning prayers. Uh, I ask the Holy Spirit just to take control of me right from the morning because I don't want to do stuff that's wrong and stupid and things that I'm just... So in the morning, one of my morning prayers, oh Holy Spirit, beloved of my soul, I adore you. Light me, guide me, strengthen me, console me. Tell me what I should do. Give me your orders. I promise to submit myself to all that you desire of me and to accept all that you permit to happen to me. Let me only know your will. That prayer was written by a Cardinal Mercier, I think about 100 years ago. It's a prayer that floods you with happiness and holiness because everything in that prayer that Cardinal Mercy wrote is meant you're asking the Holy Spirit by, by guiding you your thoughts and your actions he's going to lead you to happiness and holiness the last enemy that we talked about the devil preternatural attacks from the devil or his demons is usually mental okay the Bible tells us that mental attacks are found in Acts chapter 5, verse 3, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3. Oh, this section here is in my prayer book, Lord, prepare my hands for battle. This, this chapter there is in there. The source of, of uh, although, although the devil can also attack physically, that's in Luke chapter 13, verses 10 to 11. We call that demonic uh, oppression, physical attacks. And is represented in Scripture as flaming arrows, Ephesians 6, 16. Why does St. Paul say that the devil attacks with flaming arrows? Those flaming arrows or darts, that's, that's called angelic knowledge. Demons, the way they, they, they communicate is they project thoughts and images into the human mind. That's called angelic knowledge. And then the Bible calls those flaming arrows and they shoot for the mind. Sometimes in, in your mind, you can have annoying and debil debilitating accusations as it tells us in Revelation chapter 12, verse 10 and 11. Demons will sometimes, when it's a high level of attack on a person, usually demonic obsession at a fairly high level, you'll hear a, the constant running commentary of a demon in your mind. And that's why you'll hear people say, you know, man, this, 
Uncle Jesse, this, it doesn't go away. Night and day, this voice is telling me to kill myself and to kill mom and to, and to do this and to do that. It won't go away. So they put on earbuds and stuff and they try to listen to music. And, and you'll see this is why they try to sleep a lot. They just try to do anything that they can when they're demonically obsessed at a high level. They'll try to drown out the running commentary that demons have in the mind of the person once the person's afflicted. These attacks can be external or internal. The biblical response to demonic attacks is to resist. Number one, resist. James chapter 4, verse 7 and 10. And 1 Peter 5, verse 8 and 10. Don't just give in and, and, and turn over like, uh, you know, like, uh, and surrender. You must resist the temptation, these demonic attacks, these voices. Resistance from Christians against demonic attacks can take the forms of offensive prayer or deliverance depending upon the nature of these attacks. Now we'll end with this and, and I'll finish right on time, okay? How to resist temptations. Here's several things that work that I've been sharing with people that I do and it works. Number one, God allows the evil one to tempt us because the struggle against temptation benefits us spiritually and we grow in grace and holiness. So in one certain sense, God allows us because God is, it's like going to the gym. God is making us spiritually fit to get to heaven by these temptations. He uses these temptations kind of like a sparring partner for a boxer to get him ready for a fight. Next bullet. If you experience a temptation, that's not a sin. Only if you consent to the temptation, that's a sin. For example, I'll just get, I'm going to pick on the ladies here, okay? If you, the ladies are walk, driving down the freeway and you see a billboard with some guys that are like 20 to 25 years old, all buffed out, grease, greasy bodies, Chippendale's uh, you know, advertisement, and you're like, whoa, okay? Because the eyes, the eyes can detect beauty, okay? That's the way God made us. And so there you are driving by, grandma's right like, whoa, okay? That, now, grandma's tempted to lust, okay? She still has a body, so she's tempted to lust physiologically. But that's not a sin. She acknowledged that these guys are stunningly handsome. She acknowledged that. Oh. Now, if grandma continues driving and starts imagining that she's with these guys that she just saw on the billboard over in Cancun somewhere, in the white sands of Cancun, you know, drinking a margarita on the beach, and, uh, you know, dancing with them, you know, the, 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 then grandma has consented to the temptation with those gentlemen on the, on the, on the billboard, on the Chippendale billboard, and so that would be a sin. The consent, not looking and acknowledging that they're handsome. She's not blind. Whoa, these guys are handsome. She acknowledged that, period, end of story. If she takes it beyond that and imagines herself, you know, romping the white sands of Cancun with these guys, that's a sin, okay? That's called a consent. There is nothing wrong with acknowledging somebody's beautiful or somebody's handsome, unless you're blind, okay? There's nothing wrong with that. What is wrong is desiring to have them and lusting for them. Always remind yourself when you see somebody beautiful or handsome, say, that's my brother in Christ, that's my sister in Christ, and all of a sudden, that diffuses lust. Say, that's a child of God, that's my sister in Christ. Boom, that diffuses lust as soon as you say sister. <laughs> Next, third book, resisting temptation helps you grow in virtue and gain merit, rewards for heaven. Next, humble yourself before God and stay close to Jesus and Our Lady during the temptation. Call upon them. Jesus, help me. Mary, help me. Call upon them. Lord, come to my assistance. Lord, make haste to help me. Vocalize it. Like a humble child calling out to dad. Like if a dog's coming after you. In fact, St. Francis of Sales said when you're tempted, run to your father like if it's a wild dog coming after you. Next bullet. If temptation comes at night when you go to bed, start regular bedtime prayers before you go to sleep. And the temptations will cease. And if they still continue, pray longer. You're not praying long enough. Pray longer. Okay? Next bullet. In this life, you'll never be completely free from temptation to sin. God allows us because temptation shows us how weak we are and how much we need His grace to live a truly Christian life. Temptation also helps us detach our affections from the things of this world which are temporary. Next bullet. Play Christian music in your room as you're going to sleep. That, demons don't like praise and worship. They don't like worship music to glorify God. 
especially Gregorian chant. Especially Gregorian chant. That's what I play at night. Open up my laptop, you know, let me do our night prayers. Open my laptop, I'll, put on, I'll either put on Gregorian chant, and I put it on low. You can put it, I don't even have to hear it. Demons can hear it, and they're gone. The whole, they can't be in the presence of sacred music. Or what I'll do is I'll put an image of the Blessed Sacrament. And like I usually go, there's the one in, uh, in Poland where it has the Blessed Mother and it has the, the Holy Eucharist, you know, in her torso. And it's, it's, it's in a chapel in Poland. So I go to it at night and I click on it. And so it opens up and there it is in my laptop. So that image is projecting throughout my bedroom. There's no way, because I'm fighting demons the way they fight us. Demons fight us by projection. They, they throw images at us. And so when I go to bed at night, especially when I'm in a hotel, I put that on and I just leave it on all night. And guess what? That projects the image of Our Lady and the Eucharistic Lord throughout the whole room. They are gone. It's like rain against the Mosca, you know? <laughs> yeah. Next, uh, pray the rosary before falling to sleep. Help fill your mind with holy and pious thoughts rather than impure thoughts. Next, pray to the Lord for the grace of forgetfulness so that the Lord can wipe away all your sinful memories and thoughts. That's a good prayer. Lord, there's things that I did a long time ago. Lord, give me the grace to forget these things. Ask Him. God wants to wipe, wipe all that away. Um, next, read the Bible before you go to bed. Time spent in the Word of God builds up your immune system against the poison of sinful thoughts. Next, wear blessed objects around your neck. Go to sleep with a rosary in your hand if you have to. My wife has been sleeping with a rosary in her hand for like 30 years, okay? Since she was young. I always have the rosary in her hand. Wake up in the morning, there it is in her hand. She just, and I, I think she sleeps good because she's never told me that she has nightmares or anything. Um, next, the best way to become free of sinful thoughts is to think about something else immediately or think about the exact opposite of the sinful thought. Again, if you've got a sin, an impure thought, think immediately about the Blessed Virgin Mary. Call her to your mind or think about your mom or your grandma. Seriously, replace the bad thought with a good thought. It's called the replacement theory. It works. Replace the bad thought with a good thought. Next, um, when sinful thoughts come your way, this is for young guys, I tell them. Work out and fast. Train your body to control your, to con con train your mind to control your body. I tell them, young guys, dude, work out. Make sure you hit the gym an hour a day. Build Burn off all that sexual energy. If you start getting these thoughts, start doing push-ups, start doing sit-ups, start doing pull-ups. I tell young guys, it's good for young guys to work out, to burn all this, again, sometimes this disordered sexual energy that they may have. It's a very good thing for them to have an escape valve through their body. Next. Um, we must, we must uh, St. John Vianney says this. We must watch over our minds and our hearts and our senses, for these are the gates by which the devil enters in. Concluding statements. As Catholics, there's a lot of false teachers out there in the world right now. Some are in the Catholic Church. Hold on to sound doctrine. Hold on to sound doctrine. Look what Romans, the, the devil work operates. I'll give you one false teacher, Father James Martin, okay? Jesuit. I, I can name more, but he's just one of many. There's, there's, there's false teachers in the Catholic Church. Beware of them. Okay? Look what the Bible says. Romans 6, 17. But thanks be to God that, that although you were once slaves of sin, you have become obedient from the heart to the pattern of teaching to which you were entrusted. Notice, hold on to the teachings of Christ, not the, not the opinions of Jesuits. Okay? Father, I'm talking about Father James Martin. Okay? Specifically. 2 John... Uh, chapter 1, verse 9 and 11. Look what the Bible says there. Now, the word the word liberal and progressive, you look at the dictionary, it means the same thing. A lot of people walk around saying, Mommy, I went to college, I'm a liberal. Dad, I went to college, I'm a liberal. A lot of young people don't really know when they're saying that, how that offends God. Why? Liberal and progressive are the same thing. It's like saying car and automobile. Look what the Bible says. This is right from the New American Bible. So next time your kid from college comes home or your grandson says, Grandma, I'm a liberal. Say, are you, you know what you're saying? You're, you're, it just offends God. 2 John chapter 1, verse 9 and 11. The Bible says, not just Romero, anyone who is so progressive as not to remain in the teaching of the Christ does not have God. Whoever remains in the teaching has the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, what doctrine? The doctrine of Christ. 
Do not receive him in your house or even greet him. For whoever greets him shares in his evil works. Mm. The Bible says anyone who sows progressive does not remain in the teachings of Jesus Christ. Progressive and liberal means the same thing. That's what I hear a Catholic say, I'm a, I'm a progressive, I'm a liberal, like Biden and Pelosi. They say that. I'm like, do you know what you're saying? You are putting yourself outside of the pale of orthodoxy. You're saying, by saying that, you're saying, I don't keep the teachings of Jesus. You cannot keep the teachings of Jesus and say you're progressive. Because the teachings of Jesus don't progress. They're fixed. They're immutable. They're a rock. They don't change. Well, I'm, 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 getting, I'm getting all worked up here. I'm getting all worked up here. Okay, I'm almost done. Now, here's another, here's another place where the devil goes after people. Colleges and universities, watch out. Don't question your teachers. Don't believe everything you hear. Check out their footnotes and check out what they're getting their information from. Look what St. Paul says in Colossians chapter 2, verse 8. We're done. Beware, lest any man cheat you by philosophy and vain deceit. According to the tradition of men, according to the elements. Now, the Greek word elements means spirits or demons. I know the English word says according to the elements. The actual Greek word is, it says demons or spirits. So I'll read it in the Greek. According to the tradition of men, according to the demons of the world and not according to Christ. So what does St. Paul just tell us? That watch out for teachers whose philosophy, their tradition comes from demons. I'll give you some examples of some philosophical traditions that come from Satan. Atheism, communism, socialism, Nazism, agnosticism, terrorism, relativism, humanism. All these philosophies come from demons. And my concluding statement before we say a prayer, we'll end up on a high note. The Bible says in Romans 5.20, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. Because we live right now in such a sinful society, God is pouring grace upon the world. God is pouring grace upon us like Niagara Falls. I'm telling you, God is pouring so much grace right now it, it, it's, it's like trying to drink water from Niagara Falls or from a fire hydrant. This is how much grace God has poured upon the earth because there is so much sin. But God's grace is, is abounds, is, is much more. He gives us much more than we need. And in John chapter 1 verse 5, the Bible says, The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. The light is Jesus, the darkness is the devil. Let's say this all together three times. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. Again, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. Again, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. In other words, we are on the winning team. Even though the day looks dark, the light of Christ shines brighter in the darkness of sin. Amen? Amen. Let's close in a prayer. The Blessed Virgin Mary has said that when you go to bed at night, if you pray three Hail Marys with faith, hope, and love, she will protect you throughout the night from the devil and from mortal sin. That's her promise. And we believe it, so let's pray. In the name of the Father, Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, Pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Let's pray like the angels now. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, 
world without end. Amen. Two more times. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. When I say Jesus, repeat, I trust in you. Jesus. I trust in you. Jesus. I trust in you. Jesus. I trust in you. When I say Jesus, say, come live in my heart. Jesus. 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 In the name of the Father, Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. I, I hope you enjoyed. I uh, hope it was informational. Take the notes. Make copies. Copy them. Scan them. Teach them to other people. Do your own Bibles. I do these bi monthly Bible studies here, and I give you my notes so you can go and do the same thing. Get a bunch of people in your house, say, tonight let's talk about the three enemies of the soul. Make copies of this and go through the Bible and go through this so you can start teaching other Catholics that don't know these things. Let me mention something for the people who just walked in. Uh, I wrote a, a Catholic joke book. Funny Catholic jokes, okay? It's called Our Mouths Were Filled With Laughter. You know why I wrote it? Because I went to school with George Lopez. I did. Graduates of San Fernando High School, class of 79, okay? Uh, I know him well. And, and George, ever since high school, he used to say filthy jokes. And so I said in this book years ago, I said, hey, do you need to use it? And he goes, Jess, if I start using your books, he says, I'll be out of a job. I said, do but you'll get to heaven. Yeah. So I wrote a joke book so that we can kind of purify the conversations uh, in our homes, especially during Christmas, Thanksgiving, New Year's and stuff. When you have, when you have your uncle that has bouts of Tourette's syndrome, say, hey, you know. Let's uh, give a couple of good Catholic jokes and let them know that you don't partake with Tourette's Syndrome. Another book that is, if you want to do understand deep about spiritual warfare, this is the book that I would recommend to you. It's called The Devil in the City of Angels. I go deep into Satanism, Santa Muerte, Santeria, witchcraft, how they came to America. I, sh I share a lot of stories uh, of people that were involved in these lifestyles as well. Most of what I took, or a lot of what I took tonight is in this book here. Lord, prepare my hands for battle. Also, those prayers that I pray every night, asking Mary to blind the demons, are on page 117. I would recommend every Catholic start praying those prayers every single day for the rest of your life. Here's the two areas where the devil goes after our kids. They tell our kids, get high. Hey, it feels good. You only got one life to live, and there is no God. This is the two arguments that they use in colleges and high schools against our kids to steal their faith. That's why I wrote these books, and I wrote them very readable. 50 questions and answers. Very readable. This one is, all the questions your kids get asked about atheism, I answer them from their nutty college professors. And I answer a lot of them with science that they've never heard before. For example, the Catholic Church gave us science back in the 12th century. The church built the first university in the 9th century and instituted science in the 12th and 13th century. Most people don't know this. Also, intoxication is the way that the devil goes after our kids. That's why I wrote this book. What's wrong with marijuana? It's a gateway drug. People will start on this. It never ends well. They always end up, uh, again, using something and they, they get involved in a life of addiction. Demons like people that have addictive personalities to alcohol, drugs, pornography. Any type of addiction is an invitation, is an open door to a demon. That's all that I have. My books are back there. If you want to talk to me, I'll be back there with my wife, Anita. Thank you for coming. Have a safe drive home. God bless you. Keep the faith and long live Christ the King. Amen. Amen.